Hit save slide. All right, let's get started. Um, remind me. Oh, shoots. I just lost the little thingy. Did I close it? Hang on. I think I lost my little, um, I'm recording. Oh, there it is. Remind me to take roll later. Just tell me who's not here, and then we'll take care of it that way. But I think you're all here. I didn't count. But it's not a job that I like. All right. So we are in the chapter. This is the last bits of material for the exam. Okay. So the last bits of material for the exam. And uh, we're in the section that's talking about energy and phase changes. So we were talking about solids and liquids. And we just finished gases in the last chapter. And we're going to cover this topic. It's called a heating curve. And you should be familiar with these. No, I mean, I, you should be familiar with these after the lecture. But you should be familiar with these for the test. Um, <clears throat> so, remember what we said before. We had a solid. We have liquid. And we have gas. And... We, I wrote them like that. Why did I write them vertically with the gases at the top? Energies, yeah. It has to do with energies. Gases are the highest energies, and then the solids are at the lowest energies. So like for water, you can think about it like this. At lowest temperature, water's a solid, and the higher temperature is water's a gas. Okay, so you can think about at high temperature, that's high energy, it's a gas. So as let's imagine you have a piece of ice, like an ice cube. That's ice, baby. H2O solid, and you start heating it. And let's say let's say this is minus thirty degrees. Just making up a number, Celsius. When you start heating the ice at minus thirty, actually. Like in your refrigerator, your refrigerator is zero degrees Fahrenheit, your freezer. If you start at zero degrees Fahrenheit, pull an ice cube. You ever notice like if you take an ice cube straight out of your freezer and you stick it on your tongue, it gets stuck? Yeah. Yeah, it's because it's freezing the water on your tongue. Yeah, you get it. They all get stuck to your hand. Okay. Too many distractions, I guess. I should stop distracting this. So, ice. From a freezer is below its freezing point, and in order for you to get it to melt, actually you have to warm it up. So you're starting here at minus 30 degrees Celsius, and you add energy to it. So this is energy on this axis. It says time, but we're going to be putting and I'm going to change that to be energy. And then as you heat it up, all right, the temperature goes up, and then it goes up to this point here. And this is, okay, zero degrees Celsius. For water, that temperature is zero degrees Celsius. That's the temperature at which you go from the, the solid state to the liquid state. And that energy difference, right, from going from here to here, those two, is going to absorb that energy to convert it into the liquid state. Now, the reason it needs to do that, the molecules in the liquid state, they're moving around all the time. In order to be moving around, you need to have extra energy. Now, once it turns completely from solid to liquid, right, then the liquid will start warming up. So you'll notice here it says it's solid here, it's liquid here, and then you get to this temperature. For water, that's 100 degrees Celsius. You should know that. And if you don't, you should know it. Just learn it. It's good everyday information to have. Okay. So, having said that, between, at this temperature, this is the liquid going to the gas. So this is liquid to gas. 
This is solid to liquid. And then when all the gas, all the liquid is gone. So like if you put a pot on a stove and you put a little bit of water in it and you heat it up with a lid, what you'll see happen is the water will get hot, it'll boil. Eventually, it'll vaporize. But the whole time the water is boiling, that gas on the inside and the liquid are about 100 degrees Celsius. And then what will happen is once all the liquid's gone, the temperature will start rising again. So if you think about this, this piece of ice, it's a solid, and then you heat it up, and it, becomes, it begins to melt, and then you heat, it heats up some more, and then it vaporizes, and then it can heat up again. So you can get steam at very high temperatures. You get water vapor to be at very high temperatures. Yeah, and it condenses on your hand. So let's we'll talk about that because that's actually an important point. Okay, now you're going to go up with here. This is just the gas, and you're heating the gas. So here's here's an important here's a point related to what she said. Whose name I just forgot already. So it doesn't matter. I'm sure your name's important. I'm sorry, I say stuff. Why do you get burned when you when we open a pot? And there's steam coming out, and, and you put your hand over it. Why do you get burned? But what's the energy coming from? The bubbles. Kind of from the bubbles. It's coming from the water. But which form of the water? It's not the liquid water that's burning. It's the gas. So what happens is... Your skin, think about this. Uh, most of you, your skin is not as hot as boiling water. No. Right? You're like body temperature. And you stick your hand above a boiling pot. And then what to get the liquid to go to the gas phase, you've got to put energy into it, right? When it hits your hand, it condenses. Condensation is exothermic. So when a liquid forms from its gas state, right? So it goes from gas to liquid. It has to release energy, and that's the energy that burns, burns you. So if it didn't actually condense on your hand, you wouldn't get burned. <laughs> but your body is cooler than the boiling point of water, and so when it condenses on your hand, you get burned. Isn't that weird to think about? <laughs> All right. So, a couple of equations that you should... No, or one equation you should know. You guys know the MCAT equation? Yeah. Ooh, QCAT is what we yeah. call it. Yeah. So I'm teaching usually guys that want to go to medical school. And there's this test called the MCAT, and they need to know it for the MCAT, so they call it the MCAT. Yeah. You can call it QCAT. Fine. I don't care. Q is equal to MC delta T. So tell me, what is M? Mass. Mass. I like how they said that. What is delta T? Change in temperature. <coughs> and it can be the change in temperature in Celsius or Kelvin. It doesn't really matter because the degree sizes are the same. So if you subtract in Celsius or you subtract in Kelvin, you'll get the same temperature change. What is C? Heat capacity or specific heat. Right? It's, we call it the specific heat if it's per gram. So this is specific heat. And Q is heat energy. So that's one thing you need to know. If you have a change in temperature... It's the QCAT equation. See how adaptable I am? That was so hard for me to say. It's the QCAT equation if you have a change in temperature. So on this graph, where do you have a change in temperature? Give me the obvious answer. Where the temperature is changing, right? Like if you look at this, zoom in, right? It's here. When you have a solid or you have a liquid, or you have a gas. That's where the temperature is changing. The temperature is rising. So that's any time when you're reading a problem and you have a change in temperature, you have to, and you're talking about energy, you have to think about this Q-cat equation or M-cat equation. Okay. Next. The other thing you need to know 
about is the energy associated with phase changes. When there's no temperature, so this is where temperature changes. He has it listed here. When there's no temperature change, you use the heat of fusion. And fusion is a word the scientists have used for years to describe melting. It also, unfortunately, is a word we use to describe nuclear processes, so it can be confused. It's not that kind of fusion. <coughs> Why do they think, what, what does fusion mean? That can blend together, right? So like you take ice cubes and they're melting, you know how they look like they're blending all together? Yeah. That's fusion, okay? And then when you freeze, freezing is the opposite of melting, right? It's the same temperature, but going the different direction. All right, now heat of vaporization, that's the energy required to get something to, to be at the, in the gas state from the liquid state, provided you're at the boiling point. <clears throat> Well, there's actually a couple of different ones. So, for water, and we, do you guys know about the term delta H? Enthalpy? No, delta H? Yeah. Kind of, yes. I don't, I don't know what he said before, so I have no idea. So we call delta H. Delta H is known as the enthalpy or heat of fusion. We'll usually, um, I don't know what the subscript is for that. For water, it's about 6.01 kilojoules per mole. It could also be listed as grams, kilojoules per gram, but it's just going to be different units and a different number. And then the heat of vaporization is about 40.7. There's actually a heat of vaporization for water at room temperature, and it's slightly different. Uh, because when you're at room temperature, right, you need a little bit more energy to get it into the gas phase, and so the number is actually a little bit bigger. Okay, so all right, let's see. The way you use these uh, values, these are the equations. Q is still the heat. Okay. So Q, the energy required to melt a substance, <coughs> depends on the moles of the substance and how much energy it takes to change that state. There should be deltas in here, by the way. I think he chose not to put the deltas in there. So this should actually be N delta H fusion, and this should be N delta H vaporization. So a simple problem here. Well, it's kind of simple. Yikes. I zoomed with my giant finger, apparently. It says, how many kilojoules are required to melt 40 grams of aluminum? All right. And then they give you the heat of fusion, uh, fusion of being quite a bit, actually. All right. 30,000 kilojoules per mole. I don't actually think it's that high, but let's pretend it's right. So let's do the calculation. We want to know Q, which is going to be the moles times the delta H the fusion. So I have to take 40 grams of aluminum, convert it into moles. This is aluminum a lot. 26, right? 26.98. 26.98 grams for every one mole. This is actually work. A lot of these problems are worked out already. Oh, I guess I have to use this again. I keep forgetting to load a calculator in there. It's not like I don't have like a thousand calculators. Science teacher curse. So I'm going to go 40 divided by 26.98. I get 1.48 three moles and so I can do 1.483 moles times <coughs> it's a uh, three times ten to the fourth kilojoules per mole and then the moles will cancel out and leave me with kilojoules
That's a big number. That becomes 44,000. Let's do this. 4.4 4 times 10 to the fourth. No, wait. Yeah, fourth. Kilojoules. So let's, uh, you guys follow how I did that? Yeah. All right. So let me ask a question. If it goes from the liquid state, because this is between solid aluminum and liquid aluminum. If it goes from the liquid state to the solid state, how much energy gets released? Because this is for melting, right? If I'm melting it, I'm putting in 44,000. <coughs> Same number. Yeah, when it freezes, the same amount of energy has to be released. And melting and freezing are opposite processes. And it's the same amount of energy. It just depends on which direction you're going, whether or not it comes out or goes in. Okay? All right, do this next problem. What are we looking for, right? We're looking for the grams of ethanol. And we're going to evaporate it. This is the kilojoules of energy we'll use, and this is the heat of vaporization. Again, the equation is Q is equal to N times delta H. And I will race you to the end. You're in trouble now. I don't know. I just said that. I don't know why I said that. It just sounded fun. <laughs> oh, you need the formula for ethanol. I don't know, should I be giving him ethanol in class? Let's see. Two H six. I'm making it easier for you guys. Uh, if I remember right, that's 46, but. All right. Yeah, this is 46 grams per mole. Got it? Try to keep going. I was his age once, so totally get distractedness and being. I'm just gonna eat my granola bar. I usually have eggs for breakfast, and I ran out of eggs. Oh, I have a lot of eggs, and now I have chicken. I usually go through about seven dozen a week. Every morning I'm cooking like 15 eggs because everybody eats eggs for breakfast. So if I'm going to cook eggs for myself, I just cook it for everybody. Yeah, I'm having three, but there's a lot of people in my house. <laughs> oh, except for Michael, the, the guy who came in the other day. Yeah, he's eating more. He's like six or ten or something. I don't know. What'd you get? All right, I'll set it up. Ooh, excuse me. So I have, um, sorry, my Q is 4.3 times 10 to the fifth kilojoules. My delta H. 6.8 times 10 to the fourth kilojoules per mole. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve for moles. Moles is going to be Q divided by <coughs> delta H. So I'll end up with 4.3 times 10 to the fifth kilojoules divided by 
6.8 times 10 to the fourth kilojoules oops per mole. I don't know what my pen did there, but it did something weird. I had that number before. I only have the answer now. I don't know what that one is. 4.3 Oh wait, four three divided by six point three. So I did six point two three two. This is moles of ethanol, and then if you want grams, it's going to be six point three two moles times and then 46 grams per mole 290 so we'll call it 291 grams so what you got no yeah sort of all right if you don't get it you need it us to go back, just tell me where you got stuck, right? Oh, the answer's right there on the next slide, just so you see that. I'll leave it like that, though. i much rather you guys work the problems than just look at the slides and the answers. It's so much better for you to write. And I'll post these uh, this afternoon. So, I'm a, so uh, yeah, 290. That's the end of that chapter. Okay. You should still know how to do the MCAT equation or the QCAT or CuteCat or I don't know what you call it. Whatever. New cat. Man, my dog's being a spaz every night lately. Makes me crazy. She's pretty funny though. Kuma. What's Kuma mean? Anybody know? It's a bear in Japanese. So when she was a puppy, she looked like a little bear. So we called her Kuma. What? Spike? Okay, we're going to move to the next chapter where we'll talk about osmosis. I'm just trying to close the intermolecular forces chapter out. There we go. Your fingers hurt? I don't know. Could be a problem. If you'd be dying of a horrible disease, you should look it up on the internet. Why do my fingers hurt? You'll find all kinds of crazy reasons. I have freckles on my eyes, and on, on, like, you look it up, and it says that you have freckles in your eyes, you have cancer. I have definitely don't have cancer. Okay. All right. What's the solution? 42. Yeah. Yeah. You know the reference for that? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, this a solution is a homogeneous mixture, okay? So, you may have different solutions of different compositions, but within the solution, it's homogeneous all the way throughout. So, for example, you can have a 5% salt solution or a 7% salt solution, and the salt solutions will be homogeneous. There's all kinds of solutions, and I'm going to list a bunch of them here. It's maybe more than you need to know, but, you know, it's kind of handy information. So the most common solutions that we encounter are solids and liquids, right? So, for example, salt and water. So we have, and I'm going to, I'm going to name these components. We call one of them the solvent, and one of them is going to be the solute. Now the solute is the thing that gets dissolved and the solvent is the thing that does the dissolving. So in general terms, right, we say the solvent is in a greater amount 
and the solute is a lesser amount. So if I take a tablespoon of salt and I put it in water and I dissolve it, right, which is the solvent? Water, usually it's the water, right? So this would be an example of a liquid and a solid. It would be water and salt, which is sodium chloride, table salt, right? Uh, anybody know any other common solutions? Ones you encounter every day? What? Bullion. Yes. yes. Got it. Bullion. Yeah, but it has some chunks in it, right? Uh, not all of them. Not all of them? No chicken one? Yeah, so if there's no chunks in it, then it's homogeneous and it's a solution. So it's whatever the chicken stuff is in water, right? The bullion, the cube itself would be the solute and the water would be the solvent. Another, another example would be like soda is a solution. And what do you, what's the solvent in soda? No, no, think about it. What is the solvent in soda? What's the liquid that's in soda? No, it's water. Yeah, 90, not probably 95, 90% 90 of a soda by mass is water, and the rest of it is sugar. And then there's a little bit of flavor in there. Yeah. Unless you're doing artificially sweetened or you're doing, you know, that kind of thing. But like most sodas have about, like a, a can of soda, a 12 ounce can of soda probably weighs around three, 400 grams, right? Has about 40 grams of sugar in it. So it's about 10% sugar. So you might as well, if you really want just the sugar, you could just take like 10 teaspoons of sugar and throw it in your mouth and swallow it with a cup of water. Mm. Okay, so those are common solid liquids. Another one, though, very common is gas in a gas. A gas in the gas. That kind of s solution, uh, the most common one you encounter every day is what? Oxygen and nitrogen, right? Air. So the solvent is nitrogen. The solute is the oxygen. And then all the other things. The nitrogen's the solvent because it's the greatest component of air. It's 70 something percent of the air. Another common one. And there's a lot of these, but just so you know that these are all solutions. You can have solid solutions. Hmm. Nope. Because those are those are heterogeneous. Because if you look at them, you can at least see specks. Those are heterogeneous. So they got to be homogeneous. the the common The common solid to solid um, um, solutions are called alloys. They're metals. So you have iron. Like stainless steel is mostly iron. And then it has, like, depending on the properties you want, it has chromium or it has nickel. Uh, sometimes it has cobalt for hardness. Um, there are all these ones, right? Manganese, iron, cobalt, chromium. I don't have manganese in there. It's all those guys that typically we use to alloy with, with iron to make stainless steels to give them different properties. You have enough chromium in it, it's corrosion resistant, right, that kind of stuff. So those are examples of solid, solid. So there's all kinds of solutions. So when we're talking solutions in general, um, it could be a lot of things. Now for us, for the most part, we're doing solids and liquids, right? And we're doing particularly solids in water. Okay. So I'm going to skip that slide because I already said it. Two terms. We, there's terms that we say soluble and insoluble. So when I say something is soluble, that means it will dissolve in the other substance. Okay. So soluble means you can dissolve it in an, another. So sort of like a salt in water. Right, when I put salt in water... The salt we say is soluble, but if you do like a limestone, you guys know what limestone is? It's calcium carbonate. Same thing they make chalk out of. 
If you try to put that in water, that doesn't dissolve. So we would say that that's insoluble, okay? The term is, and oil in water is another example of an insoluble mixture. Uh, like for salad dressing, right? When you make salad dressing, you put vinegar and you put oil. What's the primary component of vinegar? Water, yeah. Vinegar is is 95, roughly 95% water. Acetic acid is the other 5%. Yeah. yeah, a lot of stuff we, because we, we, if you're going to eat it, it probably should be made of a water or something that you could process. All right. It could be oils too. All right, there's another word that I want to give to you. It's called miscible. Miscible means you can mix it at any proportion. Oh, my internet's slowing down. I can see it. Yeah, mix miscible it means you can mix it in any proportion. So, <coughs> gas mixtures are generally miscible. Like you can get any amount of nitrogen and oxygen that you want in a mixture and have it make a homogeneous solution. Alcohol and water is another example. So when you take pure alcohol and water and you mix them together, you can get any percentage of alcohol that you want. Okay, Any percent will dissolve in. So miscible just means you can mix in any proportion. Now, Solubility in one, of one substance and another depends on two things. One is things naturally want to mix. Um, do you guys know about entropy? It's not something it, you would learn it in like a college class, like after this one. You don't learn about it in Chem 3A, but you usually learn about it afterward. Entropy is the natural tendency of things to go to disorder. So like your room... Right, and you have to clean it up, and so you get it all clean, and you know you have a place for everything. At least that's what your parents always used to tell me. I mean, that's what my mom would tell me. Like, oh, you got a place for everything. Yeah. Yeah, my mom. <laughs> got a place. You get it nice and organized, and then what happens? Over time, you just let it go. Right, stuff ends up everywhere. Yeah. You have socks under your desk. I do. That's my problem. <laughs> I have socks under my desk. I won't mention my other problems, but yeah, things just get everywhere. And then, if you want to, if you want to separate it, right? Then you got to you got to put expend energy to separate the two out. And so, when we're talking about solutions, and you have one substance and another substance, there's actually a natural tendency, just like your room to get messy, for the two components to mix together to make a solution. There's just a natural tendency for that. The other thing is, is they have to have similar intermolecular forces. So the intermolecular forces of attraction are the other component which determine whether or not things will make a solution. We have a saying, which unfortunately isn't right here, but I will tell you anyways. Like dissolves like. That means things with similar intermolecular forces will form solutions with other things that have the same intermolecular forces. I saw that. Girl. Should be not doing that in class. No more coffee for you. All right. So like dissolves like. So let me give you an example. Shh, pay attention. There's three substances here, okay? Three different compounds. So the major force of attraction for this first one, the major intermolecular force is hydrogen bonding. So that's actually from the last chapter, right? When we did intermolecular forces. How do I know that one has hydrogen bonding? Because the way I drew it. It's because of this. Remember, for hydrogen bonding, an oxygen has to be bonded to a hydrogen. 
or a nitrogen has to be to a hydrogen or a fluorine has to be to a hydrogen. So this, this molecule, its major intermolecular force is hydrogen bonding. This one is nonpolar. So I'm just give you the giveaway for this, right? If it's C's and H's, carbon and hydrogen bonds are always nonpolar. So that molecule has to be nonpolar. So anytime you see a combination of just carbon and hydrogen, it's nonpolar. And it's only intermolecular force is dispersion forces or, or induced dipoles. I like the term induced dipole better. Oh, slow internet. That's the screen refreshing, that little blur. And then... Who's watching a movie in here? Stop it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It's probably not that. It could be. So um, that last molecule, what kind of intermolecular force is its major intermolecular force? Huh, huh, huh? What's the major intermolecular force? Review, what are the intermolecular forces? Induced dipoles, dipole-dipole, and hydrogen bonding, right? You guys know this? Remember this? Know it tomorrow. <laughs> Just saying. Okay, so hydrogen bonding is the strongest. Dipole, dipole is the middlest and is the in between. And then dispersion forces or induced dipoles are the weakest, right? So when you see a molecule like the one on the right, it kind of looks like the one in the middle and the one on the left, right? It has the aspects of hydrogen bonding, but it also has the aspects of being nonpolar. This is the more important component. That's the strongest intermolecular force. So this one has as its major component hydrogen bonding. So then I'll ask you a question. When I say like dissolves like, that means like substances with their inter molecules with similar intermolecular forces will tend to make solutions. Which combination will make solutions? Up there. Let's number them. Let's call this number one, number two, number three. Which combination makes a solution? One and three, because they both have hydrogen bonding. Which combinations don't make solutions? One and two or two and three, because the intermolecular forces are different. So generally speaking, things that are hydrogen bonding will form solutions with things that are hydrogen bonding or polar or ionic, okay. so like salts. And then things that are nonpolar tend not to make solutions with things that are polar or hydrogen bonding. There's a couple of more terms. Okay. <coughs> saturated. If I say your brain is saturated, what does that mean to you? Filled. Filled. You have to let it empty out a little bit. And you know how you do that? You sleep, right? You sleep and it helps you empty your brain out. Neuro the neurochemistry of your brain is actually pretty well understood at this point. And if you don't sleep, there are certain chemicals that build up in your brain that your body only clears when you're sleeping. And if you don't sleep, it, makes it, it disrupts your thinking process. Okay, that's a side note. So, Saturated means, in solution terminology, in solution lingo, okay, it means that you can't, you've dissolved the most <laughs> solute that you can into the solvent. You can't get any more in. So have the maximum solute that will dissolve in a solvent, and it's very temperature dependent, it says at that temperature. Now, let me uh, expand on that just a little bit. Solubility of solids. Solubility goes up. That's what that means. 
when temperature goes up. So that means now if you want to drink a lot of sugar, just drink it in hot water. You can get a lot to dissolve. If you don't want to drink a lot of sugar, make it cold, right? Or drink water. Yeah. So increasing the temperature increases the amount of stuff that you can dissolve. And that has to do with intermolecular forces of attraction and all that stuff. Now, it turns out for gases, it goes down for the same temperature change. So if I have a, if I have a solution, think about this, if I have a solution that has a solid dissolved in it or a gas dissolved in it, and I increase the temperature, the solubility of the solid goes up, but the gas goes down. If I decrease the temperature, the solubility of the gas goes up, and the solid might precipitate out of the solution. It might come out of solution. So unsaturated and supersaturated, I'll talk about those in a second. But how do you know when you have a saturated solution? What's that? Say that again? Uh, almost. So for a saturated solution, to know that you have a saturated solution, you always have a little solid left that won't dissolve in. And then as long as there's some solid in the solution, you'll know that the solution is saturated. Now you could get to that point, and we do this for experiments all the time. We make a saturated solution, then we filter the solid out, and then you don't see anything. But for a saturated solution, there's always a little bit of salt left. So if I have a saturated solution and I, of salt, like table salt, and I add salt crystals to it, what will happen? The salt crystals will just fall to the bottom and not dissolve. Okay? So that's like, like it, when we test to see if a solution is saturated, the only thing that we really can do practically is just to try to dissolve more solid. And we make these solutions all the time. We'll use saturated solutions all the time. Now, an unsaturated solution is simply one that's not saturated, hasn't reached that level, okay? And you're able to dissolve more. If you have a clear homogeneous solution and you want to know if it's saturated, the only way that you can know is you can add some more solid to it and it dissolves, right? But then it might not be unsaturated anymore. That's kind of the catch to that. Now, there's this term that goes along with saturation, or saturated. It's called the solubility limit. The solubility limit is the maximum amount. So it's actually the mass of material that you can dissolve. So that's the amount of, the, oh, sorry, the maximum amount. So this, if you have a saturated solution, it's said to be at its solubility limit. Okay, so we have saturated, you're at the maximum. You have unsaturated, you're below the maximum. And then you have supersaturated, which sounds like you shouldn't be able to do it, but it's above the maximum. What? Does that not make sense? That should sound wrong to you guys. Because I just said saturated is the maximum, unsaturated is below the maximum, and supersaturated is above the maximum. But how do you get above the maximum, right? Does that make sense? You have to heat it up first. Okay. So, so a supersaturated solution has more, it holds more solute than should be stable at that temperature, and these solutions are all unstable. So if you take a supersaturated solution and the supersaturated solution is unstable, what that means is eventually some of the solid will precipitate out. And it'll precipitate out until it reaches the solubility limit. That is, it'll be a saturated solution. Okay. okay. Questions on any of that? All right, we'll move on.
Um, I usually do this one in class, but didn't have time to set it up. Do you guys do the sodium acetate demo? Super saturated sodium acetate? I've done it in some years. I didn't do it. Oh. I'm going to text Austin and see if he can get it. I already have it set up. It just has to be dissolved. Hang on. All right, I'm going to have Austin set that up, and hopefully you can, you can see it in class. Um, but in a supersaturated solution, you'll have a solution that looks like the one on the left. You can't tell it's supersaturated until, until you get it to start to crystallize. And the way you get it to crystallize is you can add one crystal to it, and it'll, the whole thing will precipitate on that one crystal. So you can see in this, in this diagram here, oh, where did my pen go? Yeah. In the diagram here. He, they touch the surface right there, and that's where the crystal starts growing from. And eventually, it, huh? Oh, they probably dropped a crystal in there. It hit the top and started crystallizing and went to the bottom and is growing from the bottom. Yeah, so he's going to set it up. It'll be in the lab when we go do lab. And then we can do it. I'll let somebody add the crystal if they're a good person. I'm going to judge you. All right. Another couple of terms. A lot of terms with this chapter, so you're going to have to know a lot of definitions. Uh, another term that goes with this chapter, two terms, are dilute and concentrated. And I think on the next page is stock solution. Let me see something really quick. I think he has it later, but I'm going to put it on this slide, a stock solution. I'll tell you what it is as soon as I talk about the others. Okay, so solutions can have different compositions, different concentrations. And when, when you describe solutions, they're, either, they're often just described as dilute or concentrated. These are relative terms. So like we deal with concentrated acids all the time, and they're almost 100% like pure acid, and then we dilute those down right, to make less concentrated solutions for you guys to use in lab. Uh, we usually dilute them down with water. So dilute have, simply has a low amount of solute per solvent, and the concentrated usually has a high. And then we have this thing called the stock solution. Turns out dealing with the concentrated solution sometimes is really dangerous. And so what we do is we make more dilute solutions than the concentrated, and then we use those to make other solutions. So rather than having 100% of sulfuric acid, which is super dangerous. We get it down to about 60%, and then we can make solutions out of that relatively easy. Um, sulfuric acid, if you're not familiar with, the same acid that you find in your car battery, right? And it is super dangerous. Good stuff. All right. Oh, you know, yeah, we should do that one. Thinking about demos. Okay. Um, he only lists two concentration units that you need to work with. I'm going to tell you a third one that you should know. Right. Um, it's going to be some extra information. So concentration is the amount of solute given in amount of solution, and we have different units for it. The units, the primary units that you're going to need to know are mass percent and molarity. Now, mass percent is this. It's the mass of the solute divided by the mass of solution. Times 100%. What are the components of a solution again? It's the solute and the solvent. 
So when you say massive solution, this is solute plus solvent. <coughs> Molarity is a similar term. Molarity is the moles of solute. divided by the liters of solution. Now mass percent, the symbol for it is just percent. For molarity, it's capital M. Like that. So the, actually most of the rest of this <laughs> section is just talking about calculations, and then we do uh, uh, colligative properties where osmosis comes in. All right. Equations are mostly listed on the other pages, but I wanted to put them in one place so you could have them somewhere. So um, parts per hundred percent means per hundred, right? So if you have a 1% solution, right, and you have one gram of solute, you have how much solvent? Uh, let me say this again. If you have a 1%, you have a 1% solution, and it has one gram of solute in it, how much solvent is there? So let me write that out. So think, and I want you to think about it. It's, it's a tricky question, actually. You have a 1% solution, and you have one gram of solute. How much solvent is there? How much solvent is there? 99, right? Yeah, it's not 100. It's parts per 100. So whatever you have, let's say you have one gram, you have to have, a, you have, to have 99 grams of the other because it has to come out to be 100. If you have 60 grams of solute, then you'll have 40 grams of solvent, right? So it always has to add up to be 100. The solution total has to be 100% or 100 parts. All right, so we're going to calculate the mass percent of a solution containing 27.5 grams of ethanol in 175 milliliters of water. And you're looking at your slide going, what the heck? Is it all jumbled together? Yeah. Yeah, that's why I just deleted it all. We're just going to start over. Okay, so what are you given, right? You have 25 grams of ethanol in 175 mils of water. So your solute is 27.5 grams of ethanol. Now the abbreviation that we use in labs all the time is ETOH because it's a lot shorter. And 175 milliliters of water. And we need to find the mass percent So, um, this is the process we're going to be following. Uh, you're going to have to take and calculate the grams of solution. I don't know exactly what was in that box because I couldn't read it either. So, we're going to get grams of solution. All right. And then we're going to calculate percent. Now, one of the things that we need to know, though, is this, this 175 milliliters. Mass percent is mass divided by mass, right? But that's milliliters. So what you need to do in a problem like this, now this one's not hard to do because it's water, but this needs to be converted over to grams.
You guys know what the density of water is approximately? It's one gram per milliliter, okay? So if you have one milliliter water, it weighs about one gram. So if you have 175 mils of water, how much does that weigh? 175 gram. Now, if this wasn't water, you would have to use the density to figure out what the mass was, right? So you know that density is equal to mass divided by volume, so that the mass of a solution or a of a solution or a substance would be density times volume. But since the density is one, the numbers for the volume and the mass are going to be the same. So this this is the relate this is one of the relationships that goes down in here. The this is 175 grams of water. And then the percent is mass of solute divided by mass of solution. And the other thing to know is that the mass of solution equals solute plus solvent. So my solution mass it will be 27.5 grams plus 175 grams. So that comes out to 202.5, I think. Yeah. So my percent comes out to be What divided by what? What's the percent? It's solute divided by solution. What's the mass of the solute? <coughs> What's that? What's given, right? We look, we run down what was given. The solute is the part that gets dissolved. It's usually the lesser component. So what's the mass? 27 and a half. And the mass of the solution, the whole thing, we just added up the masses. That's 202.5 uh, times 100%. So 27 and a half divided by 202.5, that comes out times 100, is 13.6%. Hmm. The check is you just have to look to see, like, does that look like the right percentage of the total solution mass? Doing okay there? All right, good. The other unit for concentration you need to know this slide, these next slides get really repetitious, so I'm going to uh, probably bypass the stuff that's on the slide. Um, but it's the molarity. So if a, a sugar solution is two molar, right, what that means is that one liter of solution has two moles of sugar in it. If you had two liters, you'd have four. So it's always proportional to the amount of solution, the amount of solute that you have. So let's say, yeah, those are just, those questions just kill me down there. So I'm going to add a few questions here. Hang on, I'm going to make a whole nother slide. Cool, there's a slide. 
Oh, look at that, it's vertical. So we want to calculate molarity. And molarity is moles divided by volume of solution. So let's say you have 25 grams of sodium chloride and you dissolve it to make three liters of solution. What we want to do is we want to calculate the molarity. All right, so what do you need to know to calculate molarity? You need moles, right? And you need volume. So looking at the given information, I have 25 grams and I have a volume of three liters. So I already have my volume. So what does that mean I have to find that? Moles of solute, right? So to get the moles, it's going to be 25.0 grams of sodium chloride. What do I need to figure out? Like, I need the molar mass. So somebody calculate the molar mass really quick. Let's see if you can beat me. You get it? What's the molar mass? 58? Uh, I'll use 58.44. So 58.44 grams is one mole. And so that comes out to be 25 divided by 58.44, 0 0.4278 moles. And then my molarity will be 0 0.4278 moles divided by the volume of solution, so three liters. That comes out to be 0 0.142 molar, or 143, I'll round it correctly, actually. So catch the drift of that, right? Just to calculate moles in volume. Here's what we're going to do next. We're going to use this molarity and say how many milliliters of solution do you need to get 12 grams, make sure that's not, yeah, 12 grams of sodium chloride. And we're going to use this molarity, okay? So what am I given? I'm given molarity, which is 0 0.143. And this is what I always tell my students to do, is rewrite the units as moles <coughs> divided by liters. And think of that as your conversion factor. And then I'm given grams. So to get to the milliliters of solution, I'm going to start with my 12 grams. I'm going to convert it into moles. By the way, do you guys, um, this is a style thing. Do you guys, are you used to that? Or do you guys do what they call railroad tracks? Railroad tracks? Yeah, just easier. Yeah, so 12, 12, 12 grams, right? And my molar mass is still 58.44. So it's 58.44 grams is one mole. And now I'm going to convert that to liters, right? Because I can use my molarity to convert between moles and liters. And so I've got my grams canceling like this, and I need to get my moles to cancel. So I want moles at the bottom and liters at the top. And then I'm going to put 0 0.143 at the bottom like that. 
you familiar with that method? Is that how you normally do your... Yeah. Okay, good. I'm just going to stick with this. And then I cancel moles, and I have liters. Now, what, did I, what was I asked for? Milliliters. So now I have to do another conversion. There's a thousand. Oh, and then when you do the milliliter, are you guys okay with a thousand milliliters for a liter? Or do you do one milliliter is 10 to the minus third? You do it like this? Okay. Either way it works. You get the same answer. So this will, this will, ooh, this will cancel. And give me milliliters. And I just got to do all the math. Now, if somebody can beat me to the answer, this would be great. But <coughs> what'd you get? Yeah, one thousand four hundred thirty-five. So we'll call it fourteen hundred. One point four times ten to the third. Milliliters. I will let you look at the rest of the slides, but they're painfully repetitious and I don't like those. Okay, we're going to work on these ones now. Oh, hmm. we'll take a break here in a couple of minutes. We'll take a 10 minute break and we'll get back to it. How many moles of KNO3 will be in 430 mils of 2.6 molar? KONO3 solution, right? So what am I looking for? Just moles of KNO3, right? And I'm given 2.6 molar KNO3. And again, just write this out as 2.6 moles per liter. And then you see it as a conversion factor. So I have moles going to be equal to 430 milliliters. Now this is liters here, right? So I have to convert milliliters to liters. So it's a thousand milliliters for every liter. And then 2.6 moles per liter to get everything to cancel out properly. So 430 divided by 1,000 times 2.6. That's 1.1 moles. You guys think you can do the next one? All right. How many milliliters of 0.87 molar H2SO4 will contain 1.3 moles of H2SO4? So just remember, 0.87 moles <coughs> per liter. And then start with the 1.3 moles and then work your way over to milliliters. Okay, I'm going to just start writing up here, and then you check when you're done. Oh, I need milliliters.
I did mine inside the presentation. I don't want to have to deal with all the other digits. Is that what you guys got? <coughs> What'd you get? I got, well, I got this one, but then I got like to the power of four. To the power of four, huh? Hmm. So you took 1.3. Oh, never mind. I did 13. Ah, well, there we go. Good. Anybody else? So we're going to do the last one. I'll leave the other one for you guys to do. says, how many grams of sodium carbonate will be in 550 mils of 1.2 molar sodium carbonate? So we have, what we're going to start with is this. We need to remember there's 1.2 moles per liter of sodium carbonate. So we're going to go from, if you're thinking about mapping this out, it's milliliters. We're going to go to moles, and then we'll go to grams. And you need to find the molar mass of sodium carbonate. I'll find that for you and give that to you real quick so you don't have to do it. Hundred five point hundred six. So I give you about a minute to work on that, and then I'll go ahead and write the answer out, and then we can compare answers. Got it. I'll do something. Okay, good. Do you guys map all your problems out when you do them? Are you taught to do like problem solving maps? Yes, no? Okay. I'll show you how to do it later. It's actually pretty simple. But I'll show you on this problem how you do problem solving maps. <laughs> It's all based on units. All right. That was a minute. So I'm looking for grams. So I have 550 milliliters. Oh, I skipped a step because I always forget about those things. I'm going to need it in liters. And then I'm going to get it into moles. So my, my milliliters will cancel. It's 1.2 moles per liter. And I have units of moles at this point, so I'm going to do 106 grams for every mole. That's how you should have it set up. So 550, oops, I better clear that, 550, yeah. Time, oh, times 1.2 times 106 divided by 1,000. And we'll just call that 70. 70 grams. Okay, I'm going to show you the problem solving map. How you map this out, how you think about the problem, like you pre think a problem before you actually do it. So this is kind of a standard problem solving skill. So when you look at a bunch of numbers, you see a lot of numbers up there, right? So you see the 
106, which we calculated. You see the 550 and you see the 1.2. Which number do you start with? You can know which number you start with without usually knowing what the problem is. How do you know which number you start with? What's that? The given? But there's three givens, right? Basically the molar mass, there's the milliliters, and then there's the molarity. The only one of those that's a pure number is the 550. It actually represents a quantity of something. The other two numbers are ratios. You see it in the units. The units are something over something, right? So it's sodium carbonate is 106 grams per mole, and then the molarity is 1.2 moles per liter. Those are ratios. The 550 is a number, it's an actual quantity. It represents a volume of solution, it's not a something for something. So it turns out when you're looking at a problem like this, all right, that's the number you'll start with usually. Now, in the, the way you map these problems out, and I sometimes skip steps, like I skip this step in the map, but you go like this, I have milliliters, and I'm going to go to liters. All right? I know that. And then once I'm at liters, I'll have moles. And once I have moles, I can go to grams. And I'm just, I'm just mapping the units out in the problem so I can connect from the beginning to the end. So when I see that, that's how come I know, like if I start with this number, that liters will have to be on the bottom so it cancels out later. So problem mapping can be done. You don't even need the numbers. All you need is the units. And you can tell which number you start with. I know the number that I'm trying to get. I know I'm trying to get the grams. And you can map your way through every problem that way. Okay. So if it's like this one is four steps or five steps or six steps or even two steps, you can just map it out. Now, sometimes... The value in this, and this is as you get better and better at this, sometimes what happens is you know the ending unit and you know the beginning unit and you map it out and it doesn't connect. So you know the thing that you're supposed to be looking for. You know the type of units you're supposed to be looking for to do your conversion and then you just go look it up. Okay. All right. So we're going to take a break. Ten minutes. So we'll be back in ten. I'll tell Siri that too. Set a timer for 10 minutes. We're going to do dilution, we're going to do solutions, and we'll be done. I'm trying to get done, and then we're going to take lunch for 40 minutes. 40? you got to talk to boss man. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on, hang on. So listen to this. Are we all here? We're still missing people. Well, it can't take that long. All right. So this is what's going to happen in lab. In today's experiment, we're doing a gas law experiment. Uh, oh, good. They're here. We're doing a gas law experiment. We're going to go to the room, and the lab will already be set up for the most part. But in this experiment, you're using flammable liquids, so we've got to be careful about fire. And we're going to have about six to eight hot plates with boiling hot water, with a lot of boiling hot water. So when you go in there, right, we're going to put... You, do you guys have your lab coats with you? Yeah. Yes. Then you'll put your lab coats on, and as you go in, you'll put goggles on, Okay. Uh -huh. Because I don't want there to be like an accident while you're going in. And you guys are going to be real careful because all the equipment will be set up on the counters already and the water will be boiling. Otherwise, you've got to wait like 25, 30 minutes just for the water to boil. So I had Austin go in there and he's going to start all that up and set it up for us. So you'll have to thank Austin when you see him. But that's the thing. When we get into the lab. Huh? Yeah. Oh, um, which guy? The guy who... Yeah, the one who helped me with the torch? Yeah, because the other guy was my son. You guys remember the other guy? Yeah. K, that was K4. 
Because there's six children and people got tired of trying to remember their names. So they all go to they all go to Emmanuel now. And so like K1 and 2 were just actually James and Zach. And it was easy because it was just two of them. And then K3 came along and then K4 came along. And then K5 and 6 decided to go to elementary school there. Just some mass chaos, whatever it is. Okay. Oh, well, so each one of them has a real name. I didn't give them the numbers. The, 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 their coaches gave them the numbers. They're like, okay, K6, K4, whatever. Huh? <laughs> oh, man, no, I hope not. I like the six I got, but I don't think I need, I don't think I need any more. So, dilutions. Shh. Dilutions. I'm going to give you the equation. Ready for the equation? Dilution is when you take a more concentrated solution and you make it less concentrated. We usually start with a stock solution. And this is the equation. M1V1 equals M2V2. You guys know that one? Yeah. Heard it? See it? Yeah, good. That's the one we're going to use for all of these. And, and now we just have to... Do them. So let's do a couple of problems. Solution is made by adding 100 milliliters of water to 50 mils of a three molar stock solution. What is the molarity of the new solution? Now you can do this with dimensional analysis, but these are like such simple ones to do by equation. We just do equations. Now, if you want to do dimensional analysis, go ahead do dimensional analysis. What's uh, what's what's uh, 100 mils? What do you want to call that? M1, V1, or M2 or V2? V2? We'll call it V2. Then what's the 50? Got to be the other one, right? And then V3. And then at three molars, V3. Because, oh, sorry. What is it? What is it? M1. Because it's with the V1, right? So now, and it says, what is the molarity? So we're looking for M2. So M2 is equal to M1, V1 over... V2. <laughs> okay. So this is what I'm going to tell you. And I don't know what you were taught before. I'm going to write this out and show this to you so you can see it. So I'm going to go 50 milliliters times 3 molar divided by 100 milliliters, right? You notice the milliliters will cancel out? So a lot of times people will tell you, convert it to liters first. You don't have to. As long as the units are the same, they'll cancel out. So we avoid lots of problems. This becomes 1.5 molar. Okay. So as long as the units cancel, you're good. But if they don't cancel, just convert to liters and then you're good. Okay. No. You want to see it? Yes. Right. Okay. I'm going to convert. Watch this. I'm going to go. I'm going to write it like this. 50 milliliters. There's a thousand milliliters in a liter, right? And then I'm going to multiply that times 1.5 molar. So I didn't, I didn't convert it, but I showed the conversion. Oh, sorry. And on the bottom, I have a hundred milliliters, right? But the conversion is a liter is a thousand milliliters, right? That cancels out. So whatever you do to cancel the one on top, you have to do to the one on the bottom, right? So it all comes out in the wash, as they say. So here's the thing to remember. As long as the units cancel, you're good. Yes, be efficient. Do the next one. You can decide which is M1 and because she decided for everyone. Now you can decide on your own which one's M1, V1, and V2 and all that stuff. I think you should all just go eat a second sandwich. 
they, they have extras out there. Yeah, we're doing. What do they do with those? That's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't grab your sandwich first next time. That's what that means. All right. I think you already kind of know what to do here. Let's see. That was a minute and I wasted half of it just telling a joke. Okay. So uh, 120 milliliters. I'm going to call that uh, B2 just to make you mad. And then this is M2 and this is M1. All right. And so what do I, what do I want? I want V1. So V1 is equal to M2 V2 over M1. And then I'm going to just plug in numbers like uh, 1.2 M and 120 milliliters uh, and 0 0.80 molar, right? You notice I didn't do the conversion again, right? I, I looked ahead and I knew I wanted milliliters. The molarities will cancel out. So just look at your units. You don't have to do any conversions. You're done. I don't know, did it? Yes. Yes, because you have to put this volume and this molarity have to go together, right? So when you solve the equation, they're together, right? So that, that one has to be on top, I think, right? Did I do that right? Everybody else, did I do that right? Yes. Okay, good. Sometimes I get in a problem-solving frenzy, and I can't see through the blood. I just try to make chemistry sound cool sometimes. I mean, I really like it. It's like the number 42, I was going to say. Okay, so what did I get? I got 180 milliliters, right? Now... Is that the answer? Read the carefully, carefully look at the question. What is the 180? It's the volume of the solution, right? But it started as 120. You have to add water to it to get to there. So how much? You have to add 60 mils of water. Okay. Because you're adding 60 to 120 to get to the 180. So it's actually, so when you do these questions, they can they can be tricky if you just like blindly do the equation. You really have to stop and think like, what did it ask me to find? And it said milliliters of water must be added to 120 mils of that to get to 0.8. All right. I wonder what it says because the answers are down here. Oh yeah, see, look at that. I didn't, I didn't look at the answers. I feel like that's cheating. Good. I was telling my, I always say to my kids, capiche? Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit. One of the things we have to talk about is when you take a strong electrolyte and you dissolve it in water, it ionizes. You guys know that? It breaks up into its ions. So like sodium chloride, when I put sodium chloride into water and it makes a solution, what I actually have is I have a solution of sodium ions that are aqueous and chloride ions that are aqueous. You guys know that? Yes. I get one yes. Did I get other yeses? <laughs> that good. Okay, I don't know. So <laughs> like, I don't know what you guys... So all... all Ionic compounds, when they dissolve in water, break up into their ions. So, and this becomes important for when we start talking about osmosis and stuff, this becomes important to understanding how things will behave. So if I take magnesium chloride, and I say it's aqueous, what is that actually? It's magnesium ions, right? And... And I'm going to do this intentionally. I'm going to write them separately. It's a chloride and a chloride. 
The subscript 2 doesn't mean it's Cl2. It just means there's two of them, right? It's not chlorine gas attached to magnesium. So there's a total of three ions here, right? Now, did you guys cover electrolytes? Yeah. Meh? Okay, an electrolyte simply is a substance you add to water to allow electric current to be conducted. And you need, why do you need electrolytes? I'll get to you in a second. Is there a general question about this? Well, I would just, okay. Oh, yeah. Well, we need to learn about electrolytes. Why do you need electrolytes? Like, no, you, like Gatorade, right? You're drinking electrolytes. Energy. No, not energy. Because it builds up water. Water doesn't have electrolytes. And I'm not, there's water. Mineral water has a little bit, but it's almost nothing. Mostly they just want to suck the money out of your wallet. <laughs> but, but the reason you need electrolytes, how many of you know how a, ner a nerve works? Like a neuron. Okay. okay, so here, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you an example, okay? So when I was doing, when I was uh, doing research uh, in industry, now this is like 23 years ago, that's a long time ago, uh, I, I got to go to a, a brain, open, open brain surgery, and I, 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 develop, I was developing electrodes to measure neuron activity in human brains. So you take these electrodes and you stick them in their head, and you stick it up to like basically a radio, and when the brain has an idea or a muscle moves, you can hear a crackling sound from the electric current that's been created by your brain. Now your brain is made up of neurons, and the way your body communicates to other parts of your body is through electrical signals that are then converted into chemical signals. And that's why I was there, I'm a chemist, right? So I'm there for that. Okay, so they, we would take an electrode and we would stick it in a person's brain, and we would flex their arm or their leg. And you could actually hear crackling when you did this because the neurons that are in the arm were sending electrical signals up the arm through the spinal cord and into a brain region associated with movement. You can't have that without electrolytes. You need something to conduct the electricity. What's that? Oh, because it's an electrical signal and not a sound signal. Like sound is like air pressure. And, and in your neurons, and I could get, I could like give you the whole long spiel about how a neuron works and how a signal propagates and all that kind of stuff. But simple to say, you need electrolytes to do that because you have to conduct electricity to be able to do that. Why do people say like you drink electrolytes? Oh, because you get um, you need to keep your electrolytes. If you don't have your electrolytes, then um, it messes up like your physiology. You need it for certain parts of your physiology. So when you get sick, right, you lose a lot of that, and so you just have to got to put it back. You sweat it out. You also need a little bit of sugar. Like Sprite's not bad. Gatorade, Pedialyte's good. Oh, that's a long question. <laughs> it depends. Different parts of the brain operate at different, like their signals come at different frequencies. Like some in your hippocampus, I know that are giving about 120 hertz to 240 hertz. So that's cycles per second. But they're not like the sinusoidal waves that you're thinking of. They're like these sharp spikes. I don't know if you're familiar with that. But they're action potentials. And they're coming, and then they come in bursts. And the way you're communicating, you get these bursts and these quiet points and bursts. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah, so the, the tool that I was making was a diagnostic tool. And so what it was is to figure out where, where, so they were placing electrodes in the brain and they needed to put them very precisely because they needed to be in the region that controlled motor movement. And this had to do with Parkinson's disease. So they would stick the electrode I made in, flex the arms, right? And they would look for these action potentials, these signals, right? 
And then they would pull that electrode out because it was inside another large electrode. They would pull that out and put another one in, and they would burn that region of the brain out. Because they was turning that, that, that part of the brain was creating a, a feedback where the person couldn't move. That's what Parkinson's disease is. There's too much signal, and so they burn some of that out. Yeah, it's actually a miracle kind of surgery, but it doesn't last. That's the problem. So I'll, I can talk about that some other time. That's the kind of cool stuff you get to do when you do research, by the way. Okay, and I was a chemist, right? You have to remember I was a chemist, and that was neuro, neuroscience. Okay, so... Um, so electrolytes break up to form ions. You need to have electrolytes. The formula tells us how many ions, okay? So for example, if you're looking at calcium chloride, it's just like magnesium chloride. One formula unit is what it's called. Gives you one calcium ion and two chloride ions. 100 molecules would give you 100 calcium ions and 200 calcium ions. And we can extend this whole idea. If you have 0.25 molar calcium chloride, it's actually 0.25 moles per liter of calcium, but it's 0.5 moles of chloride ions. So is this like related or similar to how have association with ions? Yeah, some. Not quite, though. Okay, so find the molarity of all the ions. Assuming that these, you're making homogeneous, making solutions of these molarities, find the concentrations of all the ions. So acids do have to associate. Hydrogen ions are weird one though, because when we talk about like aquatic pressure, it doesn't behave the same way because it's so small. But when we're talking about osmotic pressure or colligative properties, if you learn that, you know, right? the more ions it has, the general is the bigger the bacteria. Should I give you a crystal? Yeah, we're not going to do the calculations, but we're going to talk about the effects. And this one would have more effects. <laughs> okay, what do we do for the first one? How much magnesium? Yeah, so it's 0 0.25 molar, right? Because it's one to one. The bromide, 0 0.50 molar. What about sodium? What's that one going to be? It's 0 0.66. Carbonate? Yeah, 0 0.33. Iron? That's iron 3 plus. <laughs> 0 0.15 but you guys just multiply by 2 right yeah okay just say times 2 if you don't know the number that's fine so 0 0.15 molar I just want to know that you know the concept and then for the sulfate what's the concept times what times 3 right so that's 0 0.225 I think of course, the answers are all right here. Look at that. So we got them all right. We're doing good, guys. Leave it. Okay, let's talk a little bit about solution stoichiometry. Okay, you guys familiar with neutralization reactions, right? Acid in a base, that's a neutralization reaction. Um, but it's off, right? Adding an acid or a base, uh, I don't know what you say up there. So here we're going to go. Does how many mils of 0.875 molar H2SO4 solution are required to react completely with 11 grams of iron? Just ignore this sentence. I'm not sure what he was doing there. So we're going to do a solution stoichiometry problem, right? How many milliliters? of a 0 0.87 molar H2SO4 solution are required to react with 11 grams of iron. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to map this problem out for you so you can see how we do the map and then we're going to solve it, okay? So I'm, going to, I'm given grams of iron, right? I'm given a molarity, 0 0.87 moles of H2SO4 per liter. 
Um, now, in stoichiometry problems, what do you have to use all the time? What's, what units do you have to go to all the time in stoichiometry problems? Moles. Moles. So my, in my head, I'm thinking this. I have grams of iron. I need to get to moles of iron. That's the molar mass, right? And now I know I'm, I'm looking for H2SO4. So I'm going to go to moles of H2SO4. I get the moles of H2SO4, because I can get there because I have the mole ratio from the balanced equation. So I know there's two moles of iron. That's the same as three moles of H2SO4. Now, once I have the moles, shh, stop it. Once I have the moles of H2SO4, I can use this to get to liters. And then what's it asking for? Milliliters. milliliters. So I'm going to do one more step. A lot of times I'll leave that off the map because I know once I get the liters, I can just convert it real easy. So that's the process. So I'm going to start with my grams of iron. Now let me ask you a question. How come I knew to start with grams of iron? What did I say about it? it it's the only number. It's like the pure number. Right? It's not a ratio. Molarity is a ratio. If you see it as moles per liter, it's a ratio. So I knew to start with the iron and not with the molarity. So I'm going to go, I, I'm going to do milliliters. It's going to start with grams of iron. So it's 11 grams of iron. Oh, and by the way, there's one, two, three, four steps. There's four conversions. So that tells me how many steps will be in my overall process. Iron, 55.85, is that 85? Yeah. So 55.85 grams for every one mole of Fe. And then I know there's two moles of Fe, because I want it to cancel, right? For every three moles H2SO4. And just to keep track of where we're at, the grams of iron are gone, the moles of iron are gone, and moles of H2SO4. So I will continue on in blue because I don't know why I'm doing red, but whatever. I need moles to cancel, right? So the 0.87 goes to the bottom. For every liter. And my last conversion, right? I know there's four. The last one, 1,000 milliliters for a liter. What about the handy dandy calculator? I got that from Blue's Clues, by the way, handy, handy dandy notebook. Right? Except for the, well, I like the old Steve better. The new Steve looks mean. What's wrong with you? So we're going to call that, sorry, 340 milliliters. Is that what you got? Or getting? That's where you're headed? <laughs> yeah. I can do this usually pretty fast. Okay. This one you'll do on your own. Okay. This is a, a more solution stoichiometry. It says how many milliliters of 2.6 molar HCl are required to neutralize 50 milliliters of 1.8 molar NaOH. So I'm going to map it out for you. But what number will I start with? The 50 milliliters, right? So I'm going to go 50 milliliters. Uh, I'll need it to be in liters. A lot of times I'll skip that step, but I know to do it while I'm doing the conversion. So I'm going to go to liters, and then I'm going to go to moles. This is NaOH, right? Moles of NaOH. And then I'll get to moles of uh, HCl. 
And this will be the mole ratio. I always call it the mole rat. Mole rat. And then I'm going to go to liters of solution. Liters of HCl. Okay. And then, then you'll convert that to milliliter. Yeah, back to milliliter. And then I'm going to show you a trick. And then you'll be like, ooh. Yeah, you will. It's another one of those I'm lazy tricks. So go ahead and do that one out. And if you want to, go ahead and do the next one out too. I'll draw the map out for that one. I'll start the map out for that one. Okay, I'm going to write the answer up. But you guys work. Too many conversions. <coughs> that should be something what you're gonna end up with. I didn't have the I don't have the answer. Somebody else can calculate the answer. Yeah, I'm gonna hopefully it doesn't mess you guys up too much. For those of you who are doing it, is that what you're getting? Yeah. Yeah? Good. What do you guys actually get an answer for it yet? Yeah. Let me get an answer. Don't tell me yet. Okay. We're gonna check each other. Thirty four point six. I got thirty four point six. Oh, we're good. We'll call it uh 34.6, why not? And that's in milliliters. Oh, gosh, I hate it. I'm right on the scroll bar. I'm way too close. Okay, do you guys see the like the trick to this, like to make it like two steps shorter? Yeah. Since I start in milliliters and I end in milliliters, I don't have to do these conversions. You see how they cancel out? Just telling you these things to save you some time. As long as the units, units cancel out and you end up with what you're looking for, you're okay. Now you can do that for me. You can do it for another teacher. They're going to be like, why'd you skip that step? And you'll have to do the long explanation. And then they're going to still take points off. I will not. Okay, so um, do the next one. See where you end up. And the map, I drew the map right over the balanced equation. And be careful, because this one has stoichiometry that's not one to one, so you can't just ignore that. Oh, and don't, don't skip the conversions on oh, this one. You can, but it, it's a little more confusing. Read 
basically college pencils. Upward back. I don't want a pencil. Yeah, I This box contains 30% recycled materials. Why? It goes in recycling. Yeah. All right. I'm going to write this out. I'm going to start with my 18 milliliters of KOH. Thousand milliliters per liter. It's zero point nine eight moles per liter, so that's all canceling like that. So I have moles of KOH, and then I have to convert to H two SO four, so it's two moles of KOH for every one mole of H two SO four. And this is where we sort of deviate from our normal plan. You want the molarity of the solution. So this is giving you the moles. And so to get the molarity, it's just going to be moles of H2SO4 per liter. So I'm going to calculate my moles. I'll calculate my liters. And then we're done. 18.3 times 0.98. Divided by two, well, that's a lot. Oh, I forgot to divide it by a thousand. Eight, I had 8.9, now that becomes 0 0.00897 moles. And my liters is, uh, my liters H2SO4, that's gonna be, hmm, 100 milliliters, 1,000 milliliters per liter. That comes out to be 0 0.100 liters. So my molarity is going to be 0 0.00897 moles divided by 0 0.100 liters. That becomes 0 0.08 moles per liter. Them's is my answers. So hopefully you head in that direction. You see what I did at least. Follow along. You probably don't do it that fast, but that's fine. Yes. The answer's on the next page too. So if you Again, I'll save this and post it. Please. Well, this is really the last slide. I'm not going to do percent weight per volume. I'm just going to talk about colligative properties. So, colligative properties is a weird definition. So, I'm going to give you the definition, another, another definition, right? Properties that depend... on the concentration of solute particles and not the identity of the particles. You're going to need to know a little more than just what they are. I'm just going to scratch that out. But you do need to know a little bit more. I'm not going to make you do all the calculations, but um, I'm going to talk about them. You need to understand how they work. Okay, so let's imagine the three that are important for you to know are the freezing point depression, 
the boiling point elevation and the idea of osmotic pressure. And there's some terms that go along with osmotic pressure that you're going to need to know. All right. So what, is, what does it sound like when I say a freezing point depression? What does that sound like? Yeah, going down. So this is a, a phenomenon where if you add something to a solution, its freezing point will be lower. At the same time, the boiling point goes up. That's what the boiling point elevation means, right? Okay, so talk about a freezing point depression for a second. So let's imagine you have a liquid, right? And in the liquid, you have, you're freezing it. So you're going to form this solid at the bottom. I'll make it, make it bigger so you can see the bottom of it. So you have the solid that you formed at the bottom. And you're freezing. So you're at the freezing point. That's zero degrees Celsius. For, let's say it's water. And you're making ice. I don't know why it's not floating. Don't ask me that. Okay, It's just stuck to the bottom for some reason. I have no idea. That's ice. And as you're freezing it, what's happening is it goes from the liquid state to the solid state. So this is liquid to solid. We're freezing the water, right? And this is actually an equilibrium. If I pull more energy out, if I extract more energy, I put it like, for example, I keep it in my freezer and it's cold. As I pull energy out, these guys will stick and then the ice crystal will grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger. Now let's say I get a different molecule, one that interferes with this process, and I dissolve it in the solution. Okay. What is that going to do to the ability for the ice to form? Make it easier or harder? Makes it harder, right? So in order to get ice to form, what do you have to do? You have to lower the temperature even further. And so it takes, you have to take more energy out. So when this, this is called a solute, right? And they, technically it's non-volatile. Remember we talked about volatile and volatiles are things that evaporate easy. So like sodium chloride, that's a non-volatile solid. It just doesn't evaporate. So we have sodium chloride particles in the solution. They interfere with the freezing. And as a result, right, freezing point is lower. Now, it also turns out if it, when it melts, it'll, it accelerates the, the melting process because it makes it hard for it to stick back to the crystal. And so it also melts at a lower temperature. So think about when you make ice cream, you got a churn. And it's going around and around. You, wanna, you guys want to make ice cream? Yeah. 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 We, oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Loser. Yeah. Wow. Party pooper. Buzzkill. <laughs> what other words do we have for you? Yeah, I'll see if we can, like, throw out one of the. No, yeah, yeah. I like cheese. Yeah. Oh, cheese. Head cheese. That's the stuff they made out of like animal parts oh, in their head. Oh. They call it head cheese. It's gross. It's nasty. In English. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Back in cat. <laughs> so when you make ice cream, what do you put on the salt? I mean, I mean, what do you put on the ice? You put salt. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Really, yeah, what do you do? Well, well, why do you do that? To make it colder. It gets colder because the freezing point goes down. That's the freezing point depression. Okay? So you add salt to the ice to lower the freezing point, and it gets really, really cold. So in terms of degrees Celsius, you can get to like minus 10 degrees Celsius. You could actually stick your hand in it and freeze your hand. I've stuck test tubes of water in salty ice and been able to freeze test tubes of water. So if you can freeze a test tube of water, you're basically a big bag of water. You can freeze your fingers. Right? So don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Now, let's talk about the other side of this. That's the freezing point depression. Well, let me ask you another question. Does it matter if it's NaCl or MgCl2 or AlCl3? Does it matter? Does it make a difference? Yes, because 
This makes two, this makes a sodium and a chloride. And, and colligative properties don't care if it's a cation or an anion. It just cares that it's there interfering and creating, making it more difficult for the solid to free, freeze. So let's say the sodium chloride, like a one molar sodium chloride solution, um, it was, let's say it was freezing at um, hmm, about minus one degree Celsius, right? The aluminum chloride would be like at minus two degrees Celsius. It would be twice the effect. Right? Just because in the aluminum chloride, right, there's an aluminum, and then there's three Cl minuses. So there's actually four particles here, and there's two particles here. You can even do it. You can even do it with sugar. If you really wanted to, you could put sucrose in there. But it turns out sucrose, which is, let's see, C12, H22O11, I think. Yeah. When it dissolves, it stays as C12H22O11. Now, this is true of most molecular compounds. When you dissolve them in water, they just stay together. So the effect of sodium chloride would be twice that of sucrose, and the uh, aluminum chloride would be twice that of uh, sodium chloride. Okay. So that stuff that we learned about electrolytes and breaking up into particles has an influence on the colligative properties. Let's look at boiling. You're saying, well, let's not. But we are, so it doesn't matter. Oh, different color. Need blue. Here's my same container, same solution, but now we're going to zoom in at the top, and when we're going and we're vaporizing, the particles are going to the gas phase, right? They're actually also condensing at the same time, just like in a solid and a liquid. It's always going both ways. It's kind of an equilibrium is what we talk about. So these ga gas particles are leaving, and now what you do is you put these non-volatile particles in here. Some of them will be at the surface. The majority of them will be on the inside. Okay. Do you think having those particles there makes it harder or easier for the water to leave? Harder, because it takes some of the space up. Because when stuff evaporates, it always happens from the surface. And the bigger the surface area, the more you can evaporate. Well, if you block part of the surface, you block some of the vapor molecules from getting out. So in order to get it to leave and become hit the for it to boil, right, you have to get the temperature higher. So that's what we call the boiling point elevation. So adding solute increases the boiling point. So at the same time you get the freezing point going down, the boiling point also goes up. I have to add one more page here so I can describe a couple other things. I'm going to talk a little bit about osmosis. Osmosis. Yeah, os osmosis. I can't help myself. I have to say things like that. Okay, osmosis has a funny definition. It's the flow of a liquid through a semi-permeable membrane. Flow of a liquid through a semi-permeable membrane. So, I'm going to draw a semi-permeable permeable membrane. Eggshell. Uh, not eggshell. Well, eggshell, but... Hang on. Hang on. 
I'm going to tell you how to make one. Not an egg. You can't make an egg. Yeah. My, right, my daughter says, I'll, you want me to make rice? I'm like, that would be impressive if you could make it. I'd want you to cook it. I don't want you to make it. Okay. Container. Water. Okay. Semi-permeable membrane. I always make my water not go through the membrane like this. Like this. So what does it mean to be permeable? Be able to go through. I like that. Semi-permeable means some things can go through and not everything can go through. So in this case, in a semi-permeable membrane, actually what you have is you have channels, openings. And they're big enough to allow water molecules to go through. There are natural semi-permeable membranes, like your skin is naturally semi-permeable. Your intestines are naturally semi-permeable. If you put water in your stomach, it goes through the linings. Like your skin's not that semi-permeable, but your stomach lining is. Another real common one, Jackson? Eggshell Egg is semi-permeable to gas. That's how a chicken lives inside the egg. But if you put an egg in vinegar, and you dissolve the shell, it'll dissolve over a couple of days, you'll get this weird sack. And that sack is actually about four cell layers thick or four layers thick, it's got different names. Anyways, that's semi-permeable too. So you pop it, you get rid of the egg yolk, and you can stretch that membrane out. You can use it in experiments and stuff. I was gonna do it and I just got too lazy. Yeah. I asked the tech, hey, can you go steal some from biology? Yeah, we can, we can set that up. It is pretty cool. We'll do it next week. So here's the deal. If, if the pressure of the water is the same, then the flow of water will be the same to the left and right. But if I increase the pressure on one side, that is like bring the water level like that, the pressure on the left, is now greater than the pressure on the right, and it'll push the water through. So the flow this way will be bigger than the flow this way, and eventually they'll even out again to get to equal height, okay? Now, here's the deal. If I put, let's say, sugar on one side, so I'm gonna take my, I'm gonna redraw this, and I'm gonna redraw it a little smaller because I just drew it gigantic for some reason. And they start off equal, so like this. And I put sugar on this side. Well, sugar molecules, they're just molecules, but they're big, right? What they do is in the semi-permeable membrane, they decrease the rate of flow going this way, but the rate of flow going this way is still unchanged. Because the holes, basically you can think about it, it's not actually how it works, but you can think about it as on the right side, you have these little balls that plug the hole when the water goes this way, and when the water goes this way, it pushes through. What's gonna happen to the water levels when you allow this to go? It's gonna increase on which side? On this, on the right side, because what happens is the flow, the flow of water from, sorry, from here to here is slower now because the sugar doesn't let the water flow as easily. And then this way, it's not affected because the water flowing this way just has to get to the other side. It has, doesn't have to go through the sugar molecules. So the result is over time, what you see happen is this side will go up and this side will go down. Okay. This is known as osmotic flow. The, the osmotic flow is that movement of liquid through that semi-permeable membrane. This height is known as the osmotic pressure. Now, if any of you um, are going to do like plant science, oh wait, all of you know plant science. You're going to have to know these terms. They're hype. So uh, you'll have to know about osmosis because this is actually how water gets into root systems. You have a root system, it rains, the rainwater comes in, it's relatively low in concentration of salts, hopefully, unless you live on that side of the valley. 
Um, and then, and then what happens is the sugar and the solids inside the root help to draw the water inside the plant. For the first two feet or so of the plant, that's how the water actually gets driven up the plant. It goes up about two feet just from osmotic flow. So having said that, um, hypertonic. This is the more concentrated side. That's the direction the water flows towards. Hypotonic is the low side. It's like in rainwater and root systems, it's never just pure water. You have something dissolved always. And so what happens is water goes from the hypo to the hyper. And what it's trying to do is it's trying to make it isotonic, which means the concentrations of stuff that's dissolved. It doesn't matter what's dissolved, just the concentration of stuff that's dissolved is the same. If you go into medicine, like nursing, these are terms that you'll need to know as well. So the reason like salt in the ground is such a problem is it's very hard for water and nutrients to get transported into the root system when you have so much salt in the ground because the salt then makes the ground hypertonic and the plant becomes hypotonic and water can't flow in. So the general remedy that they have is to put more organic material in there. What the organic material does is binds up all the salt or they flush it. How do they flush the salt out? water what did we not have a lot of in the valley usually wow. yeah so that's kind of why we have our problem we used to just flush it all out but we can't do that anymore and then on the east side where does it go I mean, it doesn't go anywhere ah yes so you go to your house you get a reverse osmosis system that's how they make water like pure water so semi-permeable membrane i'm going to draw it sideways now Oh, hang on. So, tube, semi-permeable. Water. Like uh, city water. Gross water, right? Then what they do is, it's this is in a piston. And so they push this in. Pressure. So what they do is they, they take a pump and they pump the water at high pressure through a semi-permeable membrane and then you get pure water on this side. The reason it's called reverse osmosis, it's, the, it's generally... See how quiet it gets? It's called room dynamics. Anyways, there's actually a whole, you can take whole classes on how to talk to a group. Yeah. Talk about the dynamics of volume and how you control the volume. Or how you can get a whole class to stop breathing just by doing that. A lot of you just stopped breathing when I did that. You're like... <laughs> Yeah, some people are just very responsive that way. So anyways, um, there's a percent weight volume thing here. You can look at it. Uh, there may be a question on the test, but it's the same as percent by mass. It's just percent divided by per percent mass or volume divided by total volume. So that's actually a, a calculation that's used a lot in wineries, distilleries, places that have to deal with alcohol. Okay.